City University Television presents the American Theater Wing Seminars. Working in the theater. This seminar, production. A warm welcome to the American Theater Wing seminars on working in the theater. Now in its 25th year and coming to you from the Graduate Center of the City University of New York. These seminars offer a rare opportunity to explore with the panelists the realities of working in the theater. How they did and how they got to where they are today. And today's production seminar is devoted to the Broadway show, Sideman. We will follow the creation of the play from its inception to opening night and the important promotion that follows it. We hope that you will enjoy and learn from today's experience. I'm Isabel Stevenson, Chairwoman of the Board of the American Theatre Wing, and now let me introduce to you our moderator for this seminar, a distinguished member of the theatrical community and president of the American Theatre Wing, Roy Sumlio. Roy, do you want to start? Thank you, Isabel. That's very kind. I would like to uh, start by letting you know who our panelists are. On my far right is Jay Harris, who is one of the producers of Sideman. I think he's better known as a, one of the leading theatrical, theatrical attorneys. He represents uh, Broadway shows, off-Broadway shows, and many stars. Next to him is Roy Gabay, who is the uh, general manager of Sideman. Uh, he's also um, known as a producer on Broadway. Last year, he was the recipient of a Tony Award for his uh, revival of A View from the Bridge. Roy works both as a general manager and a producer. Next to me is uh, Gary Springer. Gary Springer has his own publicity firm as partnered with Susan Chicoin, and uh, they do all kinds of public relations for film, television, Broadway, off-Broadway, and individuals. On my far left is Peter Manning, another of the producers of Sideman. Peter has been a producer, uh, been a marketing expert. He's had very, a varied career. I think he did uh, four years of producing at Vassar and uh, was, I think, the found, uh, discovered Sideman. Next to him is Nancy Richards, who is, has her own marketing and promotions firm. And I think uh, Nancy also had a background in advertising and publicity. I think she's going to tell us the mystique of marketing. And next to uh, Nancy on my left, is Drew Hodges. Drew Hodges is the creative director of Spot Co. and Spot Design, and they are the hot advertising and design firm uh, doing theater, television, and the like, and, many, and have won many awards. I think that um, rather than go into the initial history of, of uh, Sidemen, let's find out what these people really do, and I'll ask Drew, <coughs> tell me, what does the ad agency do? Um, the ad agency, I think what the ad agency does is create a personality for the show before there's a show. Um, once there's a show, the show takes that over, and the best thing sort of we're able to do is create something that matches, because very often the ads are breaking before critics have reviewed it, anyone's come, people are trying to decide if they're going to buy a ticket, and then um, we put out sort of the first face of the show. Once that happens, the ad agency sort of adjusts and hopefully coordinates with everybody how we're going to respond to how our audience is developing, who's coming, who's not, what messages are working, what messages aren't, and try and get those out there. So, but you, you take input from lots of people. How about the general manager? Do you, uh, do you get input uh, into the ad campaign? Absolutely. Uh, I, I mean, I think it's the, something like the ad campaign or the marketing approach are definitely a collective from both the creative side and the, the management and the administrative side as well. And, and does marketing collaborate? Absolutely. Um, I always think of it really as a team effort. I mean, in my position, I work very closely with the press and with the ad agency in terms of what I do. I almost enhance or, you know, supplement their work as well. And I find that, you know, my objective is to drive ticket sales. And, and that's 
you know, a team effort here of what works in terms of a campaign and, you know, targeting our audience. <coughs> we, you know, we're all working together to see who's coming on a nightly basis. And, and everybody's calling yeah. back and forth to each other. They're faxing ad slicks and, and quotes and we're faxing, you know, story ideas. And uh, so it just goes back and forth and constantly. It, it, uh, you know, to, to the producers, to the general manager, to the ad agencies, to Nancy and, and Susan and I, and uh, because everybody has input, everybody has good ideas, and how, we're all working for the same thing. To well, how does your job out. differ from Nancy's? You are you are you are well, public deal, relations. Uh, she does marketing. Distinguish them. We for deal us, more so. with with the press. Nancy deals a lot more with the public. We deal with getting the word out um, through the through the press uh, through. <coughs> The initial announcement of the production in the newspapers, uh, on TV, in the theater listings, um, getting the getting items in the newspapers in the columns in page six or Liz Smith about uh, any actors who are going to be in the production or or anything that's newsworthy from that point of view, uh, arranging stories um, in with interviews in the feature magazines or on a television show or a radio show. So it's dealing with the press where Nancy is more dealing with... Yeah, I tie in with uh, businesses. I look for sponsorships. Um, you know, I come up with sweepstakes. If I do a cast appearance uh, with... Then Gary would definitely be there, you know, working with... Uh, it probably would be a media event, and, you know, you'd be working with the stars yeah. of the show. I mean, for instance, we're working on, uh, on, a, on a dinner party right now that Nancy and I are putting uh, together. Uh, at a new restaurant, so the new restaurant is looking for some coverage. So through them, they're going to give us a little bone by, by hosting a party for uh, hotel concierges. So it's a restaurant that I know of that I've introduced Nancy to. She's putting this all together. Um, then what we'll have is the cast, and then, of course, we'll also have press. We'll have photographers from people like the Daily News or the Post or uh, to come down and shoot that in action. So it's, it's a collaboration of all... Of, of all these aspects, then they'll come and see the show and go home and tell everybody, well, I'm in from Wisconsin and I want to go see a show. What do I see? Who's going to be at the dinner party? <laughs> Isabel. <laughs> all right, but apart from that, what's, uh, who are the guests at the dinner party? What's the purpose of that? Well, I'm inviting about 320 concierges from all the hotels in the area. And, um, they actually have a choice of going to the dinner party that we're going to, uh, the, the restaurant's going to host, or an option of just seeing the show on, a, on another night. Mm -hmm. And so far, the response has been they love the idea of dinner theater. And, um, free dinner. Free right. dinner. <laughs> and a nice one anymore. as well. <laughs> and, I mean, the objective is, is to bring in the, you know, the sort of the concierge, the sales desks, the, the ticket brokers, and the hotels. And these people are great word-of-mouth people, basically, is who we're inviting to spread and help encourage guests from hotels. Well, that's a good idea. Mm -hmm. Now, what do the producers feel about all of this? I mean, you just let everybody go ahead and... and <laughs> well, it's interesting. <laughs> Coming back to what Drew said originally, maybe if, if you could take a look at the, at the, uh, the poster over there. Um, and that, that look, yeah. that whole look and the coloring and, 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 and the photograph and the jazz players, that's all out of Drew's office. This is a concept that came out of Drew's office, but, but before that, we all had a meeting, and, and the playwright has always wanted the look of the show to be like an old Blue Note jazz album from the 50s. And so we gave Drew a lot of jazz photography books and, 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 and pictures of, of old Blue Note albums, and. And, and I used to actually. And you do, had a lot of experience. Right, I had done that. several Blue Note album covers myself in early days of my design career. So it was as soon as I heard that, I was very excited by it. We knew we could make something really interesting. But we also had another thing to deal with this time: is that the play was already established and had been. We'd had it done it downtown, and then it was at the roundabout. So we weren't starting from scratch. Take us through the very beginning of it, because that's what we want to see: how Sideman really developed. Okay. It started with you. All right. The yeah. end of the summer of 95, we did a reading at Vassar, where New York State and Film was in residence, of this three-hour <coughs> opus by Warren Light in a 95-degree room, and it was long, and it was not that great. <laughs> not for profit. And this, New York yes. State and Film being a not-for-profit up at Vassar. Right. Because this is, this is, you know, there's a... Well, go ahead. That's but right. there's a, a flow here from not-for-profit into what That's it is right. now. But how much did that cost? 
the reading. Mm -hmm. Well, we had so many actors on campus at the time, and Warren wanted to hear this draft of the play, so we sort of gathered the people that were there, and we did this reading in, a, in the dorm lounge. And that reading was, there was some interesting stuff about it, but it didn't really work. And then the next year, um, well, before an that, agent did you, how, did the, how did Warren like get to you, or how did you get to him? It was, where did the play get to the hands of a first producer? Oh, the, the, my partners at New York State and Film were Leslie Erdang, Max Mayer, and Mark Lynn Baker. And Max is an old, old friend of Warren, and Warren had done readings at New York State and Film before I got there. So he sort of was part of the New York State and Film, you family. know, creative family. So he said, hey, can I do a reading of this? And we said, sure. And it happened. It didn't really work. A year later, his agent called me and said, you have to, he's done this work. He's working with Michael Mayer. They did a reading at the West Bank Cafe that Naked Angels did. And I said, I don't want you to send it to me because I know the play. I don't think it works. I, don't want, I love Warren. And I don't want to say no again because it doesn't work. Well, she said, please, 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 please. And she sent it. He'd done extraordinary work on it. And we produced it that summer at New York Stage and Film with Michael Mayer directing and the cast and a cast and designers, many of whom are still with the play now. And Peter came to me and we, we had lunch and, and, uh, and he said, well, take a look at this play. And I said, well, I saw this play. I, I, I don't know if I want to do that. But I, you know, I love the jazz and everything. But uh, so I read the play and, and it read nice. And I, you know, <laughs> I, I don't to, you know, Peter was really wildly enthusiastic about it. And, and, uh, and I read it, and I said, I like it, and I, I like it enough to do it. And I, I didn't see, admittedly, I didn't see this out of, I didn't see Broadway, I didn't see, I, I didn't look beyond, we'll do this play for four weeks, we'll rehearse it, we'll put it on for four weeks in a small theater, and Weisberger Theater Group will pay for it. Did you, have, you had a budget, to, that you were going to pay for it out of your Oh, that's the way uh, Weisberger's always done the plays. You we just pay for it. Right. And, and we knew it was going to be a losing cost, venture. How much did it cost to cost, play? Um, Pre-production, it was about uh, eighty eighty five thousand dollars 85000 dollars um, was it sixth play, wasn't it? It was the fifth. Fifth play. Yeah, $85,000. And then it was another, like, $15,000 a week to run the play. And there was no way, there's no way when you run a play for four weeks in a... 99 seat house that you're going to make, you know, you're going to get your money back. No, so that's not your intent. But no, right. it's not the intent. But that's what. Which was why we were a partner with the not for profit. That's what the Weisberger is. Jobs to lose money. Supposedly, <laughs> and they're very good at it. I thought that you're was a commercial theater. Exactly. <laughs> so that was a success at the Weisberger. So it tur yeah, it turned out yeah. to be a big success. Yes. The reviews were phenomenal, and and uh, and the, the audience were walking extended. out, and they were just. They just loved it, and, and so we, we all looked at each other and we say, we, we have to move this play. We have to move this play. So and we tried to find a way we, to do that. We tried we, to find a theater. Then it became like a Marx Brothers movie with, <laughs> with, 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 with Peter and me and Warren Light, the playwright, and Michael May, the director, running around looking at every off-Broadway theater that we thought might be available, and we got a lot of promises from off-Broadway theater owners that, yes, we can close that play and you can have that theater. And, so we said, okay, yes, sorry, they're not leaving, you know. And right. one after another, every yeah. promise kind of disappeared. Which is a huge issue on Broadway right, right now. Which and off-Broadway. And off-Broadway, well, that moving from a downtown to finding a good, solid off-Broadway is, is hard. At least I've certainly, I'm, we have several shows we're working on now that just can't find that leap. And you guys may well, have to make it through I mean, we right. had the good fortune right. of Todd Hames coming to see the play, loving it, having a slot right. at that moment empty, he said, do you want to do it here? And we were looking for a place to do it, and the theaters we were thinking about going to just, we thought, well, we'll do this, but it didn't really feel right, but we felt like we needed to further do the something. life of the play. Has and anybody else ever done it the way you did? Never. The no, right no, no, this is a complete... Um, they do do it, 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 it was just... It was It was just... It was luck. I mean, that was just, it was at a moment when... And that was difficult, because the Roundabout has a staff of people that and Gary and Susan, who had worked so hard and done such great work for us downtown, couldn't come with us there because the roundabout Hi. has press people. And, 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 it, and it was, uh, absolutely. I and and that Why was, couldn't they come? Because the roundabout had, has a, there has they press people that they work with. They only have press office. Well, it's an institutional theater. They have an ongoing I staff. They, they never lay them off. So they, they, They've never done me. what they did with us before. I mean, we, we, we never thought of this show as a Broadway play, at least I didn't. And, and, and we were looking to, to move this to an off-Broadway theater, someplace downtown or midtown or even up on Broadway, you know, Promenade or something. 
And, and then the roundup, just as we were about to sign a lease at the American Place Theater, which was literally the only place to go, and we had a cast ready to go, we had a director whose time who was available to move it, and uh, you either do it then or everything right. falls apart like Humpty Dumpty, and you, and you may not be able to ever put it back together again. Right. That's happened to plenty of plays. So you have to go at the moment. And along comes the Roundabout Theater on Broadway and says, we, we want to put you in, in our theater. But, you know, it's our, you know, it's, we had, Peter and I had produced this play, and now it's going to be the, going to the Roundabout, and there's a certain amount of, of possessory thing going on here. And, and we didn't want to lose the play, but we didn't want the play to lose itself. So, and we were also reluctant to go to Broadway at first. But well, then we safer were, way with the guarantee and then we were convinced people who were going we to come to the We were afraid that if it went to the roundabout, that it might just end up at the roundabout and never, and when it closed at the roundabout, it wouldn't reopen again. But it was a risk worth taking. But so we, it was gonna we said, okay, we'll go there. They have a subscription series. We don't have to worry about sales for four months. It'll get us launched in New York. And so we go to the roundabout, and it gets great reviews all over again. And it's accepted on Broadway without... A blink of the eye. Nobody said, "Oh, who financed that? Who financed roundabout?" Did so you. So the only financing you've done so far, uh, you had done so far at that time, was the original eighty-five thousand dollars at the Weisberger. Well, it was more than that because right. by the time we uh, were finished running the, the show, we were into the, the show the for about a hundred and a quarter, a hundred and twenty-five. So you have that much invested. Yes. In it, and then you're, you had an opportunity to earn some of that back at the roundabout. Oh uh, yes. Right. But uh, Better beyond their subscription, right? <laughs> Better than that. Well, that's even, that's even what, was, that's what was the cost of moving from downtown and to the roundabout? They never told us. I mean, that, that's they, the thing. They're, they're, they're not for profit. They're, they're a big company. They, were, they didn't tell us what it was costing, so we just had a, we made we a deal. We didn't need to know. Mm -hmm. We didn't need they, to know. We made a deal. They were paying the expenses. We, we made our own deal. Michael benefited by it. Peter benefited by it. Warren benefited by it, and the Weisberger benefited by it. We were very happy to make the deal, and, and they have a continuing interest in, in our production. And so we went to the roundabout, and we ran for, for four pretty much sold-out months there. And then the same thing happened. I mean, it was the same <laughs> problem. The Are they one of your partners? When, no. no. But the fact, that you became, the fact that you became eligible for a Tony Award by appearing at the roundabout must have been uh, quite in influential in your deciding to go there to begin with. Well, what? it would have been to move, because we'd thought about Off-Broadway, too, when we, when the, finally, after much the same thing, that the Golden became available, we thought, well, what Off-Broadway theaters were going? And we realized that if we had moved, say, to the Promenade Theater, mm -hmm. that we would have then been an Off-Broadway play that would be eligible for Tony nominations, which would have been highly controversial. We couldn't think of an instance where that, had, that would have happened where that's happened. And so with, there was not an off-Broadway theater, and the Golden wasn't available, and then something moved, and then one day they called and they said, the Golden's available, and it was the only theater available. Mm -hmm. Oh, uh, you're, say, you're yeah. saying sub, this is subsequent to the roundabout. I meant what influence, did the fact that you'd be eligible for a Tony Award influence your agreeing to go to, go to, to the roundabout, roundabout from, from the Weisberger? I don't think well, so. I thought we certainly it knew it. Plus, I mean, we certainly knew enough. that by going to the, the, the main stage at the roundabout rather than their small stage that we would become Tony eligible. And, and it certainly got everybody in the cast and, and, and the playwright and the director um, very excited about the idea that, that, that we were going from this tiny little downtown venue and in one big move we were going to be eligible for Tony Awards. Everybody was aware of that. But we also were aware, of by, by becoming eligible for Tony Awards, we had to think about where this show would go, because we always wanted to move. To, the, the goal was never to get a four-month run at the roundabout. I mean, once we knew we had a, a, a good play here and a good production, the goal was to get this running someplace open-ended so that it could, like, f test the market life. and have a life, and then, and then have a life outside of New York. But so the, the fear of that <laughs> is that... so. What you're getting are these little bursts. So you see bursts, then roundabout bursts, instead of what you may try and do with a new Broadway show, which is come in with your two-week bang to really get in front of people. So that was one of the concerns was, okay, we're moving right. again. How do we marshal people's attention back to this piece? Because it's been there twice before in smaller sections. So that was a very different challenge than, say, a new piece this fall that it's going to have its moment where no one's looked at it, no one's sure of it, and then we all get to discover it. This is a piece that was slowly gaining ground, and 
marshaling up the troops every time to say, no, look again, see this again. And on a market sort of research level, trying to figure out who had been, who hadn't been, who could we talk to that should have gone already that we could get back in. I mean, that, that's a big question that actually everything starts with is all, everybody here sits down and talks about, okay, who do we think will go? You know, the subject matter, the ticket price, when, how many of those people are around. How do you want to position it visually for the people when you decide who your audience time, is? Time of year, you know, whether it's summer, then, fall, who's, who's about? At this point, then, you've assembled the staff that we're sit sitting here now. At this point uh, now, you brought in Roy Gavet, right. mm -hmm. your general manager. Mm -hmm. You were able to bring Gary and Susan back into the right. p promotion. This is the first time that this show is now in a commercial type of structure, commercial type of entity. So we look at things a little differently, and we deal with the unions differently, and my budget uh, takes into account all that stuff. It takes into account the things that are existing from the previous productions, just the physical elements, what can be used, what can't be used. Um, the cast did not transfer intact completely from, from CSC to the roundabout and from the roundabout to um, brought the Golden. It didn't all, there were people who didn't make it all the way through. Tell us, tell us why. Well, people, there's good stories I mean, there. people, got, people got other jobs. Uh, well, just one from each. One from each. Edie, Edie Falco, Falco from CSC from to, to the roundabout. And Wendy McKenna she got a, a, her. She got an HBO series. series or, mm -hmm. you know, and then from the roundabout, which to the Golden, uh, Robert Sella, who was uh, the role, played the role of Clifford, got offered another roundabout production to take over for Alan Cumming as the MC in Cabaret. Provided he dyed his hair. Provided, right. he, provided he became his platinum blonde. Right. Um, and so we were fortunate enough to uh, be able to cast Christian Slater in, in the role, which also gave us another tool for, for Drew and Nancy to use in marketing and advertising and promotion and Gary and press. And, it, it, again, it just enhanced what we could say at another angle in which to once again relaunch Sideman and it, give it another new twist. Well, did you shock the producers when you told them how much it was going to cost? I don't <laughs> think so, actually, because <laughs> one of the what things, the it, 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 we, we capitalized the show at $750,000, which if we had to do this from scratch for, you know, starting with nothing, would be not quite double that, but you know, 1.2, 1.3 million dollars for a Broadway play of this size. We were able, you know, no rehearsal period, so to speak. I mean, we rehearsed a couple of weeks with Christian, but it was not nearly as extensive as we needed it to be. What and about scenery, props, costumes? Again, costumes, mm -hmm. except for the one for the one character, the costumes were there. The scenery had to be modified and built, rebuilt somewhat, but a lot of it was there. The props were there. Um, a lot of things were in place that enabled us to literally slip it into so the gold. big expense must have been then in Drew's department. Yeah, I mean, we tried to build... Yeah, me personally. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of money up front for pre-opening pre advertising. Um, we did 100,000 pieces of direct mail. Um, that's, that's which is fancy, right? fairly... No, actually, yeah, that's true us. That's fairly common to do 100,000 pieces, but it's just something that we need to do to make sure the first month or so was really... Right to get the word out again. I mean, there, there are so many different layers going on of ways to... What kind to of list do you use? I was just gonna, go ahead. No, no, I was going to say you should talk about how we got that list together and, and what And what we decided to choose. And how we were able to extract yeah. the... Well, I mean, it, it's a real combination. On one hand, you're always talking to your core audience, that you get all these very creative ideas of little tiny groups you can go after, but that can be really chasing a red herring because you spend a lot of time chasing. So. We're absolutely talking to straight play buyers who buy from direct mail. We know those lists. Um, adding into that, the places we have been, roundabout CSC, people who are buying less traditional plays. Um, there's a real amalgamation, and, and you go down the list and say, do you think these people will go here? We've had a lot of interesting experience lately with direct mail on that. We, my agency has worked on a lot of younger plays, uh, Freak and Rent and things like that. And, they have a whole different response to direct mail than a more traditional theater buyer. And so even direct mail is changing to try and decide who responds to direct mail and who responds mm -hmm. to TV, who responds to radio, who responds to the Times, who responds to the voice. I mean, it's a whole different niche market. So you're, you're, you're sending your direct mail piece to people who are likely to respond. <laughs> 
who go to the theater, and, and it, it certainly was um, a palpable reaction when the direct mail hit. Big. The sales went up immediately. But immediately. When, when we begin, there's sort of a master calendar, and so in terms of timing, you can, you can see, okay, direct mail's going to hit here, uh, our first big press piece is going to hit here, Rosie's hitting here, and everything is timed to try and coordinate. Direct mail goes out first, usually to try and fill in your early weeks because you're discounting those seats very often in direct mail, so you don't want to, when you as little that as you can, and yet you want to use it to start it, and then right up to opening night and then beyond, everything is put together. I'm sorry, we, I was going to say, we work with Theater Development Fund, too, which, has, which runs things like the half-price ticket booth in Times Square, mm -hmm. and also has a membership where they subsidize tickets. I mean, that's one of the first places the tourists go, is the ticket booth. And... While they may not know necessarily of Sideman, if we can promote something like the Christian Slater uh, information at the half-price ticket booth to a tourist, that's something they can, they can relate to. Those tourists are coming and they're going to see Phantom of the Opera and Beauty and the Beast and The Lion King if they're going to make plans six months in advance. And so how, try, how, how do you establish a straight play? I mean, it's, it's, it's terrifying. Well, the, interesting thing, the interesting <laughs> thing is that, is that, is that when, when you and I started to do this downtown, it wasn't about selling tickets. It was about, it was about getting a play into a certain artistic position and getting good reviews and, and enjoying a good four-week run. And it wasn't about selling tickets. And then when it went to the roundabout, the roundabout had 35,000 subscribers. So it wasn't about selling tickets there either, right. except that they do have single ticket sales. But, but now when we move to the Golden Theater, like everything oh, is right. about that's selling right. tickets. <laughs> 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 when I, when, the when, other I mean, parts every, there. Yeah, yeah. The, 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 the play is there. The, 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 the play has been, yeah. been well reviewed. Be the play has won right? a couple of prizes already. It's been nominated for a, a lot of things that it was eligible for, like the Drama Desk Award and the Outer Critics Circle Award. And, and Warren's getting an Oppie Award from Newsday, um, uh, the newspaper, for a best play. And, and uh, so it's won that. So now it's really all about selling the play. So every yeah, time we meet, one. we talk, I mean, we know, do. I'm it's about general. ticket sales, and, and it's, it's just the emphasis has changed. The play is still the thing. No marketing can create that, can fake that. If you right. could, then when they get there, they just hate <laughs> it, and then they tell everybody else, well, the ad looked good, but the play done. <laughs> How do you arrive at the ticket price to make that palatable for an audience? Where do you, who chooses well, we, how we much compare, to compare We compare um, what, you look at what the ticket prices are at, uh, for other attractions on Broadway, and, and you don't want to underprice yourself, and you don't want to overprice yourself. So you, we, we structure you, your, Why don't you want to underprice yourself? Well, you do, but you don't do it in the best seats. Um, you, you, you take your best seats, and you, you make those seats as, uh, you price them the same as another Broadway show. Roy, you work with the box office. Right. Uh, right you would know instantly if there's price resistance. Absolutely. You know? And I think what we do, I mean, there's certainly an industry standard on pricing, but <coughs> each show does its own thing. But uh, you also try to target price, so to speak. And there are people who want the convenience of being able to call or go to the window and say, I want the seventh row off the aisle, whatever it is, and whatever the service charge is, I want the convenience of getting the seat I want for the time I want, when I want. I don't want to wait on a line. I don't want to show up early. I don't, you know, and that's great. So we target for them a $60 ticket, and they can have, you know, row G, seat 101 and 103, and they are very, very happy. Then for the people who say, I can't afford the $60, but for 25 I can, they have to work a little harder and delve a little deeper and maybe do a rush kind of thing, maybe show a student ID, maybe wait online all sorts of different things and the box office definitely keeps me apprised and then I disseminate it about what kind of response and what kind of reaction we're getting. Uh, one of my programs for instance is uh, working with a lot of corporations and, and, and reaching out and maybe trying to reach a new audience who necessarily can't afford uh, a Broadway ticket and this is a fairly uh, substantial discount. It was, I think on, the, on this show, it was the same price as the direct mail piece. Right. And we're getting a great response. And basically, it was a letter composed and collaborated by all of us. It's a good play. And that's what makes yeah. it work. And I you know, agree. Yeah. I see. Well, totally agree. Roy, Roy, one of the things you're talking about is, is ticket sales and how that drives and your thinking. And this certainly, for me, is the first time. And when I, when Roy came on and we would talk to Roy and then the ticket sales were on sale and it took me a while, to, you know, I'd be talking about other things with the play because all I've ever worked on is how to make the play as good as possible. I never 
had to think about these other things. And I would talk to Roy and be on the phone for 15 minutes, and he'd say, well, do, do you want to know the rats? And I'm like, oh, yeah, yeah, I'm a Broadway producer now. I need to be, care about the rats, <laughs> you know, because I didn't, I never thought that way before. And now what Drew's saying is that you have to look at them and make sure that we're crafting stuff that is going to respond to Which is interesting for us, selling. because one of the things I was about to say was, Bringing Christian into this, yeah. I work with other people where this poster would be Christian Slater's head, you know, and that would be a choice. And it's really been remarkable to work with people who are really willing to sort of be fair to the play, not make it all about him, both on a market strategy, and he's wonderful in it, and yet it's an ensemble piece. The move um, from uh, the roundabout to Broadway was uh, uh, set and planned um, from uh, beginning in late August. And, uh, and, and from that, and, and Christian was not part of, of the thinking at that time because Christian was not, was, was not going to be in it. Rob Sella, our, our, who plays Clifford, the leading man, had accepted a job going into cabaret, and, and we, had, we had looked at a couple of possibilities of, of if we moved, who would take his place, and we were looking for just for the short period of time that Rob Sella would not be with us. And, uh, and we finally determined that we were going to bring in the understudy and let the understudy do the role for a couple of months, and then Rob would come back in the middle of November. And, and uh, the theater was available without a star, and all of the investors that had to be um, collected and, and uh, because we needed outside money. And so this is a, a not-for-profit beginning, which, which has led to a not-for-profit, the Weisberger Theater Group, being uh, the entity that is that now part of what is, in essence, a commercial production um, with commercial partners and commercial money in it. And they had all agreed to put up their money without Christian S Slater coming, no, even knowing about him. And along comes Christian Slater, who had seen the play, and he says to us, he approaches us, and he says, I really like your play, and I heard that you need someone to play Clifford for a while. I'd like to be that person. The play, as you said before, became Tony eligible at the roundabout. So that cast that was at the roundabout are the ones that are, have the eligibility for the Tony Award nominations, including Robert Sella. So if and when he comes back to the show, he will come back in as a potential you know, Tony nominee. Mm -hmm. right. Which I've worked on a lot of Tony nominee campaigns. That will happen when we're there, but you can spend a lot of energy for this moment that's way off, that sometimes, if it comes together in the right way, can really, really sell a lot of tickets, like, say, Titanic. Or something. Sometimes it's just a lovely thing. It's not necessarily the commercial be-all. It's just, it's an, it's an honor, it's a wonderful thing to be a part of, but we don't focus on that now. Uh, when we get near Tony's, every show that you work with right. is coming up with their strategy to, to be best benefiting from the possibility of being nominated. Before we return to our wonderful panelists, I would like to point out to you that The Wing is more than a sponsor of seminars and more than our famous Tony Awards, which is created for excellence in the theater. We are an organization on whose year-round programs we are dedicated to serving the theater and the community with the goal of developing new audiences. And to achieve that goal, we have created audience development programs for students like uh, Introduction to Broadway, which began seven years ago and has enabled more than 70,000 New York City high school students to attend a Broadway show, and for many of them for the very first time. And through our newest program, Theater in School, theater professionals like these that you have seen on our panels today go directly into classrooms to work with and talk to students about working in the theater. In addition, we have our hospital program, which dates back to World War II and our legendary stage door canteen. Today's version of the program utilizes talent from Broadway, Off-Broadway, and the cabaret world to entertain patients in nursing homes, veterans hospitals, children's wards, and aid centers all in the New York area. They bring the magic of theater to those who cannot get to the theater itself. We are proud of the work we do and happy for that wonderful working relationship we have with the theatrical community. And we are grateful to everyone who makes what the American Theater Wing does possible. And so now let's get back to our seminar 
on the Broadway show Sideman. A very exciting story and a very exciting start on the show that came to Broadway. I'd like to start part two with a question to Roy Sumlino, who is our moderator for today's program. And, and we have been delving into what makes this show work. And now, Roy, you take it away. Thank you, Isabel. I think one of the things we learn uh, from our panelists is that uh, all of you seem to work on more than one show at a time. And I'd like to know, in the presence of the producers, who also work on, can work on more than one show, how do you juggle that? In other words, how do you give a proper balance to the multiple shows that you have to work on in order to make a living? Uh, I'll start. Nancy, yeah. <laughs> well, <clears throat> I have, I guess, what you call a boutique type of agency. And I really try not to take on too many projects at once and, and shows that may sort of conflict with each other. Um, I'll, I may have a dramatic play, a comedy, and a couple of different types of musicals. And that way, you know, when you're pitching it, they, they're all very different. You're not competing against yourself and, and the different shows. So, um, and then I, it's leverage. Sometimes I'll have a, a hit show and I'll be able to say to them, well, if you'd like to work with me on, you know, this show, you'll have to do something for me on this other one, who may not be as visible and, you know, well known. We try very hard, and I think we're smaller than some of the other agencies, to work on shows that we really, really like. And that helps a lot. If you like it already, then you don't have to work so hard to muster up you know, the energy to really be there fighting for it. If you don't, and you don't care that much about it, I think inevitably the ones you really love are going to come to the forefront and you go, oh, yeah, but i got to make sure that gets done, too. So if you work on things that you really adore, then you just find yourself doing it all the time. I mean, it, it's and often sometimes it's a little hard because a producer that you like a lot and have a real relationship wants you to help them with something else. And, you know, there's a loyalty there that you want to maintain. And yet, I think if you don't have a feeling for it, you can't really do that good a job on it. Do you ever turn out to, turn out to be successful? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. You said the Not magic so. word producer. <laughs> so I'm going to get back to the producer. Can we ask about percentages, for example, of the whole cost of the show? Now that you are in commercial theater, how does it work? What percentage goes to you? What percentage goes to... Gary, what percentage goes? How, does, how do you break down your budget? Are you, are you talking in terms of salaries or? I, I'm just what, talking in budget. Why don't you do it separately, Roy? Why don't you I mean, first do it in Yeah, I mean, seconds. people are, are, as far as compensation, I mean, people are paid uh, weekly salaries. Mm -hmm. um, the ad agency is paid by a commission on its the the media the you're paid on places. by a commission are, are you right, we we get a percentage of the media that's put in and so we don't get paid on a salary right. basis we get what, did you get anything as a, a block payment before no no it's all that, based on no, which, the which can be hairy mm -hmm. you yeah. can be working for months on a show with no ad placed yet and so you're right. not making any money until that ad mm -hmm. goes in right um, but the the most of the other personnel get paid actual mm -hmm. weekly salaries. Um, the creative team, the director, the designers, uh, get paid upfront production fees, block amounts, and then weekly a royalty structure, sometime based on a percentage of what the show brings in at the box office, sometimes just a fixed amount that's not based on the, the gross of the show. It depends. That's more for the case of the designers. Mm -hmm. um, Did you get credit for the fees that were paid for the other three? Incarnations before going to the gold. Well, the, the, those that that yes, um, yes. Uh, the, uh, the the Weisberger, for example, gets uh, a royalty and has a proper participation by reason of uh, the, the the original production. Roundabout has uh, the same thing. Um, they have a, a, a ongoing participation. They have an ongoing participation because of what they did for the production. Um, How about CSC? That was, was just we just rented, just that. We just rented the theater. <laughs> yeah. oh, okay. that, was that was just the space. Yeah, so they, they, they were paid. What's um, interesting is how many people, when Roy talks about you know, the staffing of a Broadway play, this production is virtually the same production that was at CSC, the same cast, virtually the same set. And the amount of people that go in 
to working is just mind-boggling for what is essentially the same production mm -hmm. in a different theater. But the amount of people that need to go into doing things that some of the J and I are getting. Into? What do you mean? Well, the, there's there's someone to do everything. I mean, when you're doing something off Broadway for you know a small play for a hundred thousand mm -hmm. dollars, everyone's doing six jobs because you just roll up your sleeves and you Get you do done. what you can do. You know, you're the company manager, the general manager, the producer, the payroll. You know, you just do everything because that's what the, the Broadway the theater is. doesn't allow for that. But I, There's but a much, saying, it's a much more hierarchical but, sort of but, but structure. Are you saying, but you're really not saying that you could do it with less people on Broadway, are you? I think you, we're you doing could, it. Oh, you could physically, thing. you could physically <laughs> put on the show with less people. You can't, by virtue of the structure, the way the unions and the Broadway theater really built up, you can't people. legally or err. What is the structure that you're talking about? The structure I'm talking about is like when you rent a theater on Broadway, it comes with a house crew. When you rent the CSC space on 13th Street, you get four walls and a stage. You could do anything you want in it and put anyone you want we, in At CSC, it. we had this wonderful young guy named David Anderson who was running around backstage doing more things than is humanly possible. When and you, now you have... When you rent a Broadway theater, they say you get the theater and you get, with that theater, a house carpenter a house electrician, a house prop person, and a house flyman, and a house manager. Right off the bat, that comes with your package. Then you need to match those people with your production carpenter, production electrician, production pop props person, your company manager, and your flyman. Now, we don't fly on the show, but that's the basic structure. So right away, you've got that. Equity rules change when you get into larger theaters and different kinds of contracts. Whereas off off Broadway, they'll uh, let the stage manager, who also is calling the cues, if it's not too complicated, run the lights and run the sound. On Broadway, there is one person solely running the board that operates the lighting cues. One person solely running the board that operates the sound cues. One stage manager calling the show. One assistant stage manager doing something else. So you are forced, for lack of a better word, into certain kind of structural situations. If I'm shooting a photograph downtown, I can plug it in. On a very simple level, I can't shoot a photograph in a stage in a Broadway house without bringing in a house electrician who right. will literally take a regular household plug and put it to And I don't mean that in any negative right. way, but you have to work within the structure that's there. You can't invent your own. What about, not, you don't what about this is a this. controversial structure we're bringing up, mm -hmm. you know, this is... What about you? Would your salary, uh, is your structure different? Broadway, or then if you were to work off Broadway? Absolutely. I mean, mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's based on a, a, a upfront pre-production production fee and a weekly, but the amounts definitely change, not only Broadway to bro off-Broadway, but Broadway musical play, or off-Broadway, 499C <coughs> Theater, 399C Theater, 299C Theater, 199C Theater. I mean, you have to be very in tune with, because unlike the other mediums of film and television, where you can always increase the number of showings a day and the number of foreign territories it's shown in, eight times a week, fixed number of seats. That's all we ever get. You can't get any more in. You can't add more seats to the theater, and you can't do more than eight shows a week. It's, it's not able to grow exponentially like the other art forms, so you've got to be very conscious that there is a cap on what can come in. Off-Broadway, there's the only union you really have to deal with is equity. Pretty much. I no. Mean, the, uh, directors, uh, well, yeah, managers, uh, and, equ and equity are the three unions that have actual collective bargaining agreements with the Off-Broadway League. When you're on Broadway, can you negotiate with these unions to say, we do not need the extra electrician carpenter? <laughs> yeah. It's no. very, well, very difficult. Roy, Roy mm -hmm. you don't really uh, think about your own show for a minute. Do you think you could, uh, there's anybody who's not working backstage? No. Right. Everybody is working. Absolutely. So I, I, I don't want the unions to get a bad rap. No, no, no. And They're, it's not the unions mm -hmm. imposing this yeah, by any no, means. Just find out how it right. works. So. It, by any means. It's no, no one's sitting around smoking, you know, right. saying, where's my Those paycheck? Those days are gone where you by had standby mm -hmm. people who were sitting and, there playing Pinaco or And I will be the, the first cellar. to say that the unions have been incredibly, at least uh, in my career, in my productions, incredibly cooperative on special needs. I mean, totally because right. the one thing is, I mean, producing plays and musicals is not an assembly line type of activity. It is so specific and unique to every single show. But you've got to standardize something as a place to begin. So they're trying their best mm -hmm. to have some sort of standard. And then within that, you go into work on it. Because sh truly, 
every show is unique. And they, they write these books and they think they've covered every base. And sure and enough, the show happens. comes along and you think, we never saw this before. You know, we have Swan Lake. We, how do we deal with a ballet on Broadway? And, you Roy know, and I had a, 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 a show a couple of seasons ago, The Hairy Ape, which was playing in the theater on 42nd Street, which had not been used as a Broadway theater, and we didn't have enough seats to qualify for Broadway. And the producers took the position that we're not Broadway. And if we're not Broadway, then we don't have to follow all the union requirements, and therefore we can do the show for less money. But then that didn't sit well with the unions at all, and so we ended up in negotiations, really literally in negotiations around big tables, with six or seven unions who wanted, who wanted recognition. And it was like the beginning of the theater. We, we were actually in a position of saying, well, will we recognize the union as a bargaining unit or not? And we worked out, I mean, they were very, they turned out to be very reasonable. Yeah. And, that's, and that's they the, are people. I'd like to say that's that the, the key. I think they're reasonable. They were very reasonable. And, and it turned out to be a really fascinating experience. And we all ended up happy. And the show, it, we, we, the show did have to spend more money. But they didn't, you know, it, it, was, it was all manageable. I'd like to say the cooperation level is very high. I mean, it truly is. Well, one of the odd things about what they're all saying is that there's less money in general in smaller off-Broadway pieces, and in general, the work is the same. That basically, I, I think the work is similar. The, the hard work involved with getting Sideman to work at CSC and the hard work involved getting Sideman to work at the Golden is very similar, and yet just by nature of what it is, and I think you're seeing this flourishing of drama and, and smaller institutional theaters really by the love of a lot of people. That if everyone was in it just to make money, we'd just work on Andrew Lloyd Webber right. musicals, and all. I mean, that's what we would do over and over. And so that's an interesting surprise about it, is that doing the smaller shows isn't easier. It's sometimes it's harder, because there's less oh, money to make things happen. It's a lot harder. Um, and there's less money. People just do it because they love the shows. They want to support that kind of quality. I think that comes out, actually, to an audience as well. I think the audience can sense uh, some sort of unity amongst the, the, the team itself. Mm -hmm. I think that they know that they're giving. But I, I'm delighted that you seem to agree that, that uh, everybody participating in the theater, whether they be unions or employers, are really cooperating, and there isn't a, 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 that old-fashioned kind of theater. And I, and I, I would add theater owners to that mix, too, mm -hmm. right. I mean, who I truly find very cooperative. I mean, talking about this struggle to look for a theater, I mean, there's certain, you know, if a theater's booked, it's booked, if it's not, it's not. But, but for the most part, I've had two shows recently that have had hard times finding theaters, and the owners have, you know, bent over backwards as much as they can to be as accommodating as they could. And they are investing besides when you need investment. Absolutely. Frequently. Yes, and they did right. in, in Side Man. The Schubert uh, took an investment in Side Man, which so pleased that, me that, very that's, much. That's what's, I think, gotten so wonderful about the Broadway theater, that there's a spirit of everybody coming together and cooperating. Now, if you could do that with the critics. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, everybody else is helping out. Why don't you go? <laughs> sure. On that point, I'm going to just interrupt for a minute and go to our question. What would you like to ask? Hi, my name is Melissa Ponte, and this question is open to all the panelists. My question is, um, how does marketing, merchandising, play a role in marketing, and is it a good tool? You want to take it? I'll take it. Um, so far on Sideman, there isn't merchandising. Uh, there could be. There may well be. There aren't t-shirts, caps, those kinds of deals. Um, it's not, a, I wouldn't say it's a tool. You got, it may be a tool to sort of support dollars. I mean, I've certainly seen it be a real rich place for someone to do well with. But it really only works strongly after you already have some of your earlier concerns set. I mean, you, you're not seeing people make a whole lot of money on merchandising unless their show is extraordinarily successful already. So the, sh the show has to come first. I don't, you can't use merchandising as a way of making a show work. You can, if you have a successful show, you can enhance, enhance by having yeah. some good... But if you have everybody walking around with a t-shirt of an unknown show, they're gonna, it's going to get known, isn't it? Yeah, but I don't think you have that many people buying t-shirts for unknown shows. They tend to buy t-shirts yeah. for shows that are already... You're giving it away to, to get... Right, right. right. You okay, that's that. a promotion, that's a marketing tool. Next question. Hi, um, my name is Bonnie Regan, and my question is um, for Mr. Manning. I was curious as to where producers get their money to finance the show. Well, um... Different places. I mean, as a not-for-profit producer, Roy was saying earlier, foundations, individuals, and uh, ticket sales, and <coughs> corporations. And I guess it's, it's 
you're getting it from individuals in the commercial theater, and it's scarier because you need to give them something back. I mean, in the not-for-profit theater, you're just giving them art. You're just saying, we need this to continue doing what we do because we have to do it. But an investment is a different thing than a contribution. And it's been interesting to figure out, to understand that, that dynamic. We've begun but to see a change where corporations are investing in commercial theater. But truly, for the most part, I mean, short of the 10, 11, 12 million dollar musicals, it's individuals. I mean, it literally is people, you know, saying, writing out a check and handing it over. It's a mom and pop operation. Very much. Well, inside me, and, um, uh, some of the investors are uh, some friends of mine, uh, my sister, <laughs> um, uh, two of my clients uh, who are producers who I, I went to in a different role. Um, instead of as their lawyer, I went to them in the role of, of something else, um, a theater owner. And then, um, and then, and then um, we found a partner uh, who had seen and loved the show, who's a producer in California, who wanted to be involved and, and herself raised, um, raised some money. And, and it came together pretty quickly and surprisingly um, pretty Easily. painlessly. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. um, but then but when you have something that's, that, that, that <coughs> you have something that, uh, that, that people can see that, that, that has a reasonably yeah. good chance to succeed, which we, we, we think that Sideman does, and you don't know until, until it happens. Um, there are people in the theater, traditional investors in the theater, who are willing to take the risk, which is not like going to, to a Wall Street analyst and, and looking at what we have and saying, yeah, that looks like it, you could project into something um, profitable. It, it, it doesn't really work that way. It can't be analyzed and it can't be, it, it can't be computerized and analyzed by investment bankers to say that's a good investment. You, right. you, you're either a theater investor willing to take a, a, a chance on something which could close, that play closed up there. <laughs> already um, three performances four performances it's very scary you open on Broadway and you're gone in four days um, and the money's gone with it uh, or not I mean you, you don't you, you, it, it's completely not dependent on how good um, the product works or whether it's a suit that sells or something like that but those investors then are not investing purely for the economics of it they're oh, also no. Oh, no. Very they're, they're investing they're the, for the personal reasons because because they have a, a relationship with Peter or a relationship with me uh, or they're, they're investing because they really like the play and they want to support the play, which is probably the, the paramount reason why anybody right. puts money into a play. And there is an advantage to, to Sideman in that Sideman has been twice reviewed by the New York critics and always favorably. So it's not a question Pretty of... Pretty good bet. Of, they go we have to wait till opening night and see what the critics say about it. We already know what the critics say about Sideman. They love it. And the audiences love it. And so what it really comes down to is can this play be marketed to people who will go to see it and spend the money to go to see the play. We have another it's... question here. Sorry. Hi, my name is Lisa Zayas, and this is open to the panel. What role, if any, does the internet play in marketing? We're on the internet. Uh, well, but, uh, uh, in terms of publicity, for instance, uh, we had uh, Warren, uh, the playwright, on AOL chat the other night. He did a, um, a jazz room chat, uh, which was four hours long. He was on for about two and a half hours, um, talking to various jazz you know, aficionados all over the all over the world. Um, so it, it opens from a publicity point of view wide open. I think we've got Frank Wood doing one in a couple of weeks, who was uh, plays the father in uh, one of the side men. Um, uh, again, on an internet chat. So it's it is very useful. And there's a, on Playbill Online, mm -hmm. we're offering a discount for people you know who want to go on. They can. There's a lot of online. stories on Playbill Online about the show also. And and every we're beginning to see more ticket the show, sales There's another online. story on yeah, Playbill no. Online. The shows also, differ, but some of the yeah. particularly younger shows are, some shows are seeing quite a large percentage of tickets sold, quite a large being I've heard of a show that sold 5% of tickets on the internet, which wow. is an extraordinary amount. So I think if that holds up, we'll begin to see more aggressive efforts to sell tickets on the internet. It is actually a great way to buy At the very beginning of this, you, you just glossed over the various avenues that you've taken, and obviously the direct mail approach has been something that's been very good for you, and it sounds like a really new and, and smart way of selling tickets. You talked about radio. What about television? Is that too expensive for a straight play? Yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. Uh, Which is so you feel that you, 
you can cover what you need. You can't without. just go out there with, a, with being on two times in a week. For television to be effective, you have to have sort of a minimum level of, of consistency of buy. So, and even making a television spot is not an inexpensive proposition, although you can try and cheat that. But in general, the time itself is too expensive, and, and it doesn't make sense to go out and buy two spots you know, Thursday and Friday on the Today Show and never be on again. Which is why we're lucky work. we have somebody like Christian Slater who the right. television shows are interested in. As I said, he's doing Rosie. Uh, we're talking about doing Charlie Rose Show. Uh, Entertainment Tonight wants to come <coughs> and, and shoot some footage and do interviews. So it'll get out to the mass audience through the publicity where they'll be, you know, running a clip of the show. They'll be running some footage from the show. So it'll tease people uh, who can see it, and then they'll be talking to various people. Well, we could always spend more money on advertising. I mean, that's, right. you can spend a lot of money on advertising, but I would say to you that it's sort of diminishing returns at right, some point. It's just point. not I mean, that feasible. I wish I had in, as much time as we, <laughs> we need to keep on going with this, but unfortunately, we have to bring it to a close. You've, been an absolutely wonderful panel, and this production panel today has been on what it is to produce a show, and the show is Sidemen, an exciting new writer, an exciting new play that's come to Broadway, and its travels have been dissected, and we've followed them along the way that's brought them to Broadway, and, and the people that are on the panel today have been most generous in sharing their knowledge and their expertise on what it is to produce a show to bring its wonderful, wonderful excitement to an audience. Thank you so much. This is the American Theatre Wing Seminar on Working in the Theatre. Thank you again for being here. Yeah.